Music by Handel, performed by Milosh and taken from the guitarist's new album Burok on the Sony Classical label. I'm Martin Cullingford, editor of Gramophone, and welcome to this week's podcast, which is brought to you in association with Wigmore Hall, where in the coming week you can hear recitals by recent Gramophone Award winners, the mezzo-soprano Helen Charleston and viola player Timothy Riddow, Sir Andrew Schiff on both piano and forte piano, multiple Editor's Choice recipients, the Kaleidoscope Chamber Collective, and much more. For a full list of concerts, visit wigmore-hall.org.uk. Milosh's new album is a journey of music around the continent of Europe in the era of the Baroque and is named an editor's choice in the current issue of Gramophone. I met up with him to talk about the story behind this wonderful recording. Milosh, welcome to the Gramophone podcast. Great to see you, Martin. Now, your albums to date have explored some of the key areas and composers of the classical guitar repertoire. And here we now are taking a journey into the music of the Baroque. So why this era and why now? because it felt right. It was all I wanted to do. And it was a new departure for me when it comes to my recordings. Baroque repertoire has been in my fingers and in my heart for many, many years. I've performed concerts almost never without a piece of Bach or something from the Baroque period, but it was always part of a bigger thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, focusing exclusively on the Baroque period was something I wanted to do for a long time, but I think it had to come as a result of many, many processes and many closed chapters. And uh, right now I feel like this album starts a new chapter. It starts a chapter where, in a similar way like with my first album, Mediterraneo, which explored the repertoire, which is very much in the core of the guitar, the repertoire from Spain, from, from Italy, from, from, from the region, from the kind of home region of the guitar, I feel that with the Baroque, I'm kind of starting from the very core of myself. Because I, as an artist, always felt that I have to embrace the darkness and the light and the extremes of expression and, and emotion. And putting that on the tape, through this miraculous music has been all I, I, I wished for. But though it's been part of your life from a young playing age, to prepare a program, an album like this, would have required an, an intense focus. So at what point of the last few years did you say, this is going to be my next project, this is going to be my, my focus? In the last few years, obviously, there was a lot of time spent at home and there was a lot of free time. And I used that time with opening myself to, to listening to a lot of music and to really being inspired by the great artists that um, I love and, and, and loved over the years. And a lot of that was singers and ensembles. A lot of that was Baroque. Um, and I thought, why is it not possible to bring this to the guitar? Um, I'm thinking of Carmignola's Vivaldi recording or of um, Sokolov's um, Ramo or Tarot's Krupp Kupron or Pogorelic Scarlatti. Um, I'm thinking of, 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 of the sort of legends of, 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 of our world uh, and this repertoire. And I just wanted to see how far can I push the guitar into that world, allowing it to find its own voice within that world beyond what is normal for the guitar and the, and the Baroque repertoire. In the classical guitar um, niche, Bach plays a major role. Weiss plays a, a decent role. Some Scarlatti sonatas, but they serve us more to impress than to express. And I wanted to see whether there is more we can do, whether there is a, a repertoire that 
I thought was brilliant when I was listening to, 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 to the artists around me and, and to see whether I could take something like that and take that energy and try to bring it into this recording. And, and it was a lot of trial and error and a lot of, um, failed attempts at transcriptions and, and, because sometimes it just doesn't work. Sometimes there is a critical note that cannot sustain in, in a position. Mm-hmm. As you know, guitar is a very, very complex instrument. And, and when you are especially dealing with such, uh, such uh, complicated polyphony, you have four fingers of the left hand to, to, to hold it all and to sustain it all. And yet it has to sound effortless. Mm-hmm. And the rule number one in transcriptions is if you're doing them, you have to add another layer of quality, another layer of, 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 of value to the original idea. Otherwise, it becomes a compromise. And I don't like compromises very much. Now, before we explore a little more of that, let's just look at the programme itself. So you've included the works of nine composers drawn from across the continent of, of Europe of that period. Some you've, you've mentioned already. Scarlatti, Vivaldi, Rameau, Handel, Weiss, Couperin, Boccherini. Carcello, and of course, Bach. How did you seek to put this programme together? Was it variety that you were looking for? Did you want to tell a story about that period in its diversity across Europe at that time? That was the starting point. And the most uh, interesting thing, perhaps, is that I was making an album of Baroque without Bach. And I, because originally I felt that Bach is something that I'm going to deal with later, um, and that deserves its own space and its own time, um, and it just goes into that box. So while I was doing this tour around Europe and musically searching and picking and and trying to find these 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 pearls of the repertoire, even the word Baroque is. Uh, I learned this actually from the wonderful gentleman that that wrote the liner notes. These derived from uh, how the Portuguese jewelry makers referred to the to the irregular pearls that they were working with. So baroque is a unique beauty of every different pearl. In the same way, it's like the unique beauty of all of us individuals of all of the people on the earth. We are so different and so beautiful in our own way. And that so uh, uh, wonderfully applies to the music of that period, which is so filled with contrast and, and, and filled with irregularities and, 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 and wild energy that is bursting out of everywhere. And also the, the, the calmest and deepest moments of, of reflection and, and, and sensitivity. I feel that Baroque, even though it's so embellished, it's never superficial. It's 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 never anything but wonderful. And you go around Europe, and you're inspired by the uh, the colors of 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 the national identity as well, because you know the music from the court of Louis XIV uh, of Rameau or Couperin is not going to sound very different to the one from the Spanish court where Scarlatti was, or or, or, or handle, Germany yes, or yeah. handle in London or you know it's, it's just it's 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 so fascinating and then and then when that whole process was over and when I had the arrangements when I had the transcriptions when I was ready to to to, to sit there and when I knew which Vivaldi movements I wanted to do when I met with Johnny when we just discussed it all I felt like this is this is so fascinating and it's such a wonderful journey of 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 different influences but in the end the one thing that unites it all is bach and the moment i i i i i put the chacon in the mix i felt that suddenly my solar system of composers and music had its sun and that all of the other things were in that system like the planets are around the sun Bach is the beginning and the end. It's where where it all comes together. And 
And it's a really beautiful performance of the, the Chicon from the second partita for solo violin. And I mean, it's one of the most extraordinary creations in all music, but, but I always find it, it works wonderfully on, on guitar, that guitar somehow brings something very almost poetically serene to it. And I don't know whether that's the sort of percussive element of how a guitar string is plucked, brings a sense of space or, or vulnerability within, within its power, but it, it's certainly very different to what a violin brings. And this is your own transcription of it. So you've clearly, it's clearly a work that you've been deeply immersed in. So share a little about what the work means to you and, and how you approached your transcription. Many years in the making. Uh, for every guitarist, uh, Chacon usually starts with Segovia's transcription um, because he brought it to the guitar. Um, but now, I think it's more important to start from the violin original and to see where the embellishments are, what is the truth of that piece without a big personality like Segovia. And that's how I began my journey with the Chacon during my student days at the Royal Academy. After that, it took many cycles of tackling the piece to arrive to a point where I felt I would be able to record it. Because I was, I would play it in a series of concerts and then I would leave it. And then a few years later, I would again play it. And then I lost the score, which had all my markings. Right. And then I had to somehow start all over again. But of course, I remembered everything. But, but it, was, it was really um, a positive in the negative. And then in this moment, I, I really felt that the piece is starting to to ground itself. It's starting to feel like it sits firmly on the ground. It's a, it starts to be part of you. It goes under your skin and it starts growing with you. And in the last 10 years, um, I have played it in recitals quite regularly. I shall never forget the last Albert Hall last summer when it wasn't on the program. And then the night before, I just decided I have to do it. And it was... If after that performance I never played a note again, I would have been a happy man because what that piece is able to achieve in the room is just it's just extraordinary. Yeah. Um, and um, and being able to channel that that truth and that piece through the guitar, which as you said, um, makes the piece much more vulnerable, much more exposed, and perhaps even more true to what Bach wanted it to be, given why and how it was conceived. I felt that uh, I was ready to put it on the tape. And it somehow wasn't a forced decision at all. I didn't even need to have it on the album, but somehow that's what made it all make sense. If you look at other works on the album, you mentioned Vice earlier. Sylvius Leopold's Vice, he wrote exclusively for the lute um, and arrangements of his music will be well known to guitarists, but beyond that, perhaps less so. But obviously a name you've had a long association with through, through your own playing and your own training. Tell us a little bit about, about Vice, about his, his music and, and about the pieces that you've chosen for here. I have never been a Vice specialist. I have played some of Vice works um, again more in this kind of, it's part of a big picture, it's just one color, it's just one idea. And actually realizing that Weiss left behind such a vast amount of repertoire that is so adaptable for the guitar, even though lute and guitar are not really directly related, it's a, it's a, it's a funny <laughs> phenomenon. I thought it has to be represented here because outside of the guitar world, not many people know about Weiss. And mm -hmm. The beauty of his sound world. I selected the Fantasia and Passacaglia simply because those two pieces spoke to me in a very direct way. Um, I, I feel very happy playing those two pieces. I find them incredibly uh, satisfying to play um, and I wanted them to be part of this rainbow of Baroque works that the album has.
Now, the Johnny you mentioned earlier, Jonathan Cohen, this is a mixture of solo and concerto repertoire. And for the latter, you're joined by Jonathan Cohen and his splendid ensemble Archangelo. Now, concerto playing with guitar can pose challenges with, with balance between guitar and the orchestra. But here in the slightly more pared back period world of the Brock, do you find that's the same with perhaps later concertos or does it all feel much, much more closer linked like a tapestry? It's very different. Um, but at the same time, it is part of the whole process to find your sound. Mm. And I always start with the sound. For me, that is my sound, is my religion. And having uh, the opportunity to apply that sound to a completely new world and to, again, be vulnerable in front of people who are experts like Johnny and his players. It was uh, spectacularly inspiring for me. Johnny is perhaps the most generous, kind, wonderful collaborator I have ever encountered. Um, and he never took my vulnerability against me. He always empowered it even more and, and, and made me believe in my own Baroque voice, even though sometimes I wasn't sure what that is going to be. In the beginning of, of this whole process, I thought that there is something in my playing and in my approach that I have to change, that I have to be someone else in order to be worthy of this repertoire. And actually, while working with Johnny, I realized that it's only going to work if I believe in my identity and allow that identity to to, to take a plunge into the unknown. And that was really the basis of our relationship. And every time we met, we would be a step closer to where we were, where, where we are we were planning to go with this music. The repertoire kept changing. It was uh, not always clear what works, what doesn't. And, you know, Lester Harmonica for four violins, it's played on, 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 on just one guitar and we are not using any multi-tracking. Right. So we are not doing any of the studio tricks because I wanted this album to be as pure as possible and and uh and it works. It becomes another concerto. So now so now we can have more Vivaldi movements and not just the D major. Yeah. Uh which is the one that, that we hear so often played. And I just loved that process. I love seeing how when when you are with the players of Arcangelo not one take is the same. They constantly improvise and change and move in a in a fearless way, and and I find that uh, so scary, Martin. It's like when I when I just I I could never do something like that. It's yeah. it's, it's impossible because I spend hours and hours and hours to try to sort of pin down <laughs> the way that I want it to sound, and and then you go in and they just play, and yeah. what a gift. Talking of collaborators, um, though you've transcribed pieces here yourself, Michael Lewin is also another key figure on this album. He was your teacher and he's made some of these transcriptions. Tell me about him and how you work with him and the role he's played in this, this record. I met Michael uh, when I came to the Royal Academy of Music. I was 17 years old. I was clueless. I was completely green. I was out of my depth. I felt like I landed on Mars when I arrived there from Montenegro in 2000. And Michael was the most kind, uh, gentle uh, guide for me uh, at the academy. I had a lot of catching up to do, but he never wanted me to change who I was. He empowered who I was by giving me the best tools that mm -hmm. I could possibly have. And when I graduated, uh, our relationship became very different. Um, we collaborated on transcriptions in the past, even on Mediterranean uh, 
some of the Albanese pieces and the fire that I play are transcribed by Michael because no one knows my playing better. And no one is as perfectionist as I am, like Michael is. Um, and together we are ridiculous, but we always find a way to make it work. Mm. Um, and and I enjoy those sessions and, and those 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 times when we are together working on something which is always on the edge and and getting that feeling ah it works mm. um, and that's a that's a driving force of our uh, creative partnership which has never been more present than in this album mm. you talked earlier about finding shaping creating your your baroque sound now we've spoken before about your beautiful greg smallman guitar how well did you feel that that lent itself to this music oh i do have a new guitar okay tell me about your new guitar <laughs> <laughs> but my new guitar is also another smallman right um and uh, i have a good story about that actually when i played a concert in perth in australia in 2014 uh, Greg came to the concert and I was so excited to meet him because it was as if I was meeting the creator. Uh, my guitar was everything to me and I loved small moon guitars all my life. John Williams was my biggest influence um, and, you know, to this day, like my ultimate um, hero. And and that sound and this aesthetic of 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 of, of of John Williams and of Smallman and all of that is all I ever wanted to have. And uh, I was very happy with my guitar. I didn't know Greg at the time when I ordered it in 2007 and I was lucky to get it quickly because I knew someone who knew him and that's how it goes. But uh, he had no idea what he sent me. And in the meantime, it became I, I became well known. I started recording albums and so on. And he contacted me and he said, I need you to have my best guitar. So I'm coming to Perth and I'm going to bring you two of my guitars and you can choose the one you want. Just take it. And what a dream. Like you, you, you really think, wow, am I dreaming? So there he was with two guitars. I tried them. I had them for a couple of days. And in the end, I said to him, you know, Greg, I like mine better. And I'm just going to stick to mine. But um, he said, Give, let me see it. And he saw it and he thought, okay, even though I didn't know you, I did send you a very good guitar. You're right. I said, yes, um, I'm very happy with it, but let's make a deal. When you may have made the best guitar you have ever made, when you think that's the one, I want to have it. It can be in two years, in five years, in 10 years, in 15 years, but the moment you have it, I want to have it. And just before the pandemic, uh, this was six years later, we weren't in touch very much because he, he lives a very quiet life. He sent me a message with a video. He said, hi, Milos, I think I have it. <laughs> and the guitar was on the way to me um, and I received it. And uh, when I received it, I was so excited. But not playing the old guitar was a huge process. And the new guitar, stayed under my bed for three years and uh, I just couldn't bear leaving the memories of the guitar behind and then the moment came when it just felt the time was right I was in America something little happened to my guitar so it had to be corrected and fixed and I started to discover the new instrument and I found that it had so much to offer and that the sound was 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 different, slightly slightly brighter, a little bit more glamorous, more effervescent, that it was responding in a different way. And it's such a glorious instrument. And I think an instrument like that lends itself to any period. Yeah, what a wonderful story. Well, Brock, the beautiful new album from Milosh is available now on the Sony Classical label. Milosh, thank you for joining me today to tell me all about it. Wonderful to talk to you, Martin, as always.
music by Silvius Leopold Weiss to close our episode this week, and my thanks to this week's guest, the guitarist Milosh. My thanks too to Wigmore Hall for supporting this week's podcast, and for a full list of concerts at the acclaimed London Chamber Music venue, visit wigmore-hall.org.uk. And finally, thank you for listening. If you've enjoyed it, we'd be hugely grateful if you could leave a rating or a review, hit the subscribe button, or simply tell your friends about our work. And if you want to explore classical music in even greater depth with Gramophone, then we produce a monthly magazine packed full of interviews, features and reviews. And all listeners to this podcast can get a 20% discount by visiting gramophone.co.uk forward slash subscribe and entering podcast20 at the checkout. And do join us again for another Gramophone podcast next week.